Today I'm going to show you how to repair a hole in your knitwork using a glove that has a hole in the thumb. So this is a glove that has uh, a hole in the thumb. And we're going to darn the hole and repair it so I can wear the glove again. As you can see, the hole really interferes with using the glove. But they're really wonderful gloves, so we want to repair them. And the first thing I've done is I've gone and found all of the thread that's close in color to the thread that's on it. The closer you match, the better the repair will look. But, of course, you may not have the exact same yarn. And or you might have yarn close enough, but it's a full unopened roll, which I did, in fact. So I went through all of my scraps, and I found these pieces of yarn. So I wound up, I, I, I think I like the, uh, the one that I just rolled up the best. So Now the next thing you need is you need to find something that's about the size of your th and shape of your thumb, or if, if you're doing the heel of a sock, you'd be using a round ball. You need something that's hard, that's why I tapped on it, but so that the uh, needle doesn't accidentally pick up pieces. So you don't want to stuff this with a piece of fabric, for instance. You want to stuff it with something that's going to stop the needle. And it needs to be around the size of the volume that you're sewing around in order to not accidentally shrink the thing you're using. So I'm pulling out all the different needles I have, and, and the camera's not aimed really well, so you can't see them. But I'm just basically showing you some of the different kinds of needles you could use for darning. Uh, they, do, they sell them at craft shops, they sell them at sewing shops, there's all sorts. So we've got the object, in this case it's the handle of a cheese slicer, stuffed in under the hole that you're going to work with, and you're selecting out a needle um, to put in it. Boy, am I ever slow, huh? I can narrate faster than this. See, that's an example of these kind of needles. They're kind of nifty because you could put the needle, the, the yarn in really easily. And then um, even if your yarn is very, very short so that you can't actually even stretch the length of the needle, you could put it in at the beginning of the needle. And then the needle can go through and then pull the yarn through. So even really short yarn can be used. So you want to get a set of these if you're going to be working with yarn at all. And I have no idea why or how that tangled. So now we're going to fray the end of the yarn because I don't have the patience to figure it out while I'm trying to watch, a, while I'm trying to make a video. <laughs> so there, we got that out. The yarn's frayed, and I'll just pull that straight with my other hand. And uh, I could still use this yarn. So I'm not going to use those ones. I My favorite needle is a steel needle. Uh, I don't like these plastic things. There's, there's no special reason for it except that I'm a snob and I think that metal is fancier. I thought this came off and I had a point in, but no, that's just a tack cap. That thing is actually designed for putting ribbon through a waistband and similar jobs, stringing something through. So Now you want to select the largest needle, and I thought I was in camera, sorry. You want to select the largest needle, the smallest needle I mean, that you can, so you get more maneuverabil maneuverability. The smaller the needle, the better. But it has to have a big enough eye to allow you to thread your yarn. That was when I remembered that I have this needle threading device that's really quite nifty. So I'm trying to get that out of my little jar over there. It's an old M&M's jar that I keep there. Check it out. It's got really fine wire that I'm putting through. You can kind of see it occasionally. And then the wire, it's really easy to thread your yarn through the wire, see? Or you, there's smaller versions for sewing as well. Then when you pull the needle on it, boom! Your yarn is now on the needle, and you just have to pull the yarn out of the wire eye. And you've got a threaded needle, and none of this licking and twisting and poking and peering and squinting. So there you are. You've got your yarn in your hand. Um, matches the color, it matches, preferably it matches the uh, gauge of the yarn that you're using. You don't want to use a really thin yarn on a thick knit. Uh, the more the yarn matches what you're working with, the less obvious the patch will be. It's not like you're going to hide the patch because you're not going to try and mimic the shape of the stitches. You're trying to patch a hole and it will look like a patch but the closer the yarn is to the original, the less it'll be noticed. So I'm, I'm just going to start pulling through. Now what I did was I put the needle up and down and up and down and up and down through as many stitches at the bottom of the hole as I could. And I'm going to work my way up. And as the hole appears, I won't be able to pick up any more stitches in the middle. And so I'll just string across. 
but you want to pick up as much as you can at the top and bottom of the hole and at the sides of the hole. So you just thread that needle through and pull it through. There you go. All the way back again. And uh, there I got you some more light so you can see better. And uh, pull, pull, pull. It looks like I managed to keep this in camera. That's good. And I tied a knot in the end because now you don't have to worry about that. We're going to stitch that taggy bit of yarn back into the patch at the end of the job. So back and forth across in one direction. We're just going to keep weaving the needle. You, you bring the needle up, down, up, down. And if possible, you want to try and create a sort of a pattern because you're going for a basket weave effect ultimately. The more interlocked the fibers are with existing fibers and each other when you're done, the better. Because we're also going to be going vertical. We're going to, first we're making a horizontal grid and then we're going to weave back and forth vertically. And then I actually weave in an X form in both directions because this thumb, as you can see, has popped out once already. And um, I did this damage in one evening of holding a dog's leash. So here you can see we're just stringing across the hole because at this point there's nothing more to weave through. Uh, so we're creating fabric in the middle of nothing by stringing this across. Don't pull it too tight, but pull it snug. That's why you've got the form under there to keep you from accidentally pulling it shut to where you can't, it, it makes a lump or a bump. You want that you want that uh, space to be approximately the shape it originally was. So you want to stuff something in there that does not catch the needle. Oh, look, I got tangled. Something that doesn't catch the needle, but will fill the space. Um, now, I'm not pulling it really, really tight, so I don't need something that swells the space. I just need a reminder. Oh, yeah, leave the gap open. You're not sewing it shut. You're sewing over top of it and across it. You're actually creating fabric right over top of the hole with your new yarn. So you're just going back and forth horizontally. Just grab a few at the side, go across, grab a few at the other side. Make sure you're anchored into good solid wool though because if you just grab the strandy bits that are breaking it's not going to last. Your patch is just going to come free and you're going to have like this little square of woven yarn that's fallen off of your glove. So you really want to make sure you're grabbing as much solid yarn at the sides as you can and work your way all the way up top and bottom into the good healthy yarn again. Um, and weave up and down, up and down. You, if you just string across and you don't add lots of lumps and ups and downs in there, it's, it's not going to have any kind of strength. It's just going to be stringy and messy. So make sure you push that needle up and down and up and down. And yeah, you can go through entire strands of yarn too if you really want to. Uh, I try to avoid it because it affects the stretchiness of the final fabric and you know yarn is expected to be stretchy so you want to keep it as loose and moving as possible in that sense and uh, the best way to do that is don't cross the strands of one yarn with another one by sewing through the through the strand so around it under it over it and around it see there I just I picked up a strand and went no no I'll take the whole the whole bit of yarn so this is my last line on the top. As you can see, it's into good solid wool here. And uh, there you go. Now we're going to go vertically. Now I'm going to try and go over the ones that are up and under the ones that are over. So I'll pick up one of the original yarn, and then I'll start doing my over-under, trying to pick up the original yarn to make an extra lump. You see, it's, it's a bit more challenging. If, if the yarn sticks out, I try to go over it. If the yarn's hidden, I try to pick it up bring it out into the top to create the under over and I also remembered at the last minute you really should start in the healthy yarn at the side when you start this just like you did for the top and bottom you want to try and start in the healthy yarn so here I am um, I went kind of all the way down to the purple because it was pretty torn up there and I wanted as I say good healthy yarn and yeah, you're always going to have tangles, especially when you start with such a long piece. I could have cut it shorter, but I didn't know how much yarn it was going to take to do this. And I didn't, I, I don't like, you, you can't, it, it's a lot harder to join two pieces than to cut them later. So that's the first line of the vertical. And um, here we're going to really try in earnest to get some under over. If the last one went over it, then this one goes under it. If the last one went under it, this one goes over it. So this time your needle is going to go over under instead of under over. 
and uh, it, we're not looking for perfection here. If you want to be anal about it and, uh, and, and, and make it look perfect, you can take that time. I just want to wear my gloves again. So, you know, there we go, my nice wool gloves. It's not like I can replace them. Have you seen some of these for sale? If you have, they're probably expensive. And what a shame to throw them out. Yeah, I got it tangled around the cheese slicer. That, that was a little frustrating. But, you know, why wouldn't you repair instead of replace? This didn't cost me anything. Well, time. The time isn't, time isn't, I'm sorry, but your time isn't worth money. If you think your time is worth money, then you have been bought and sold by the corporate agenda. Your time is there for you to enjoy. And this can be an enjoyable thing if you're patient enough not to let the little frustrations ruin it for you. Being able to see under your own hands something like this coming together. Even with all the little frustrations, there's just so much sense of satisfaction and, and strength and power in it. It's like, I have the power to repair my beloved gloves. And frankly, I, I've never seen another pair of gloves quite as groovy as these. I've got another pair of rainbow gloves, but they're not hand knitted out of big thick wool. They're acrylic and they're machine knitted. These, I have never seen another pair since I bought them. And that was a while ago. So you can see I'm trying very hard to pick up strands that are lost underneath and go over strands that are sticking out on top to give myself a basket weave effect. And away we go. We're just about done. So, but I noticed that there were gaps and holes, so I decided to go across in a diagonal just to add to the strength and the solidity of it. And again, weave up, down, up, down. You want to really interlock those strands and uh, yeah, pulling it tight but not too tight always remember pull it snug not tight and then you could uh, yeah give it a bit of a you see that little hole there we're gonna fill that up we're gonna cover that over you see yeah see weaving it in weaving it in I suppose I could have gone between them I don't know it's not that serious. Um, it affects the neatness of the job, but in this case, my yarn is so close that when I was done, unless you actually picked up the glove and examined it, you wouldn't even know it had been patched. It just came out really nice and lovely. So I, I did both diagonals. So that's the bottom of that diagonal. And then I had to sew across the bottom to get to the other one. You could also sew across the top, across to the top, you know. Uh, across the side and start at the top, but I decided by looking at the gaps in the fabric that there was more need for strength here than at the top. So I picked up some more healthy fabric, and as you can see, I actually went farther out than the, than the original patch because the patch was starting to create new holes. And the idea here is to get rid of all the holes and make a nice solid fabric. Plus, of course, this is the thumb pad. The thicker, the better. Uh, the thumb pad is going to experience a lot of wear. So will the heel or toe of your sock where you've got a hole. Uh, if, if you're just repairing a snag in a, in a sweater, um, and this is exactly how you'd repair a really bad snag where the, the fabric, had, the, the yarn had torn and you now had a real hole, you'd repair it similarly. And in that case, you'd probably just pin it flat to something or just hold it open flat. But you'd use the same technique, but you wouldn't bother with the diagonal. You'd just do some really nice, and on a sweater, you want it nice and tidy. Nice, neat, tidy uh, horizontals and verticals, and then you'd call it done. But when you're dealing with something like gloves and socks, you, you need to, or elbows, you need to make a fairly thick fabric there. It's going to go under the same level of assault as it previously did the injury. And um, in this case, I was think I forgot to say I did it in one night walking a dog with these gloves on it was a big mistake to put these gloves on her leash is really tough and she's a very strong dog and is learning not to pull and so that thumb was constantly grabbing the leash and exerting force and rubbing against the braiding of the leash so now what I'm doing is I'm bringing the final thread down to the bottom where the tag 
taggy bit is from the start because I'm going to tie them together because it's just the simplest, easiest possible way. So I just cut it short because I was done. I didn't cut it too short. I wanted enough, enough tail to be able to comfortably tie a knot in it. And I'm uh, selecting out one of those, those funky needles I was showing you earlier that are really easy to use with short yarn. And so you get to see how that gets used. And, uh, oh yeah, I decided at the last minute, maybe I'd like to have these a little shorter. So, oh, that's right. I had a strand that was traveling across the middle without enough um, overlapping strands. It was a large enough stretch to get snagged. So I redid that part and did a little more up, down, up, down, under, over. And as you can see, this needle would have worked as well as the steel one. And uh, so we, we just tie a straight up mindless granny knot or it's not a real square knot it's just a granny knot it's just careless bam bam and cut and cut and now these tiny short things you would never get a regular needle to do this job but this little split needle is just really does the the bee's knees there you go see watch watch how I can just take that and I could just weave it back and forth in between the strands of the fabric that I've now created until it's far enough along, pull it out, and it's gone. And there you have it. That is now ready to wear again. And you can see that my thumb isn't at all visible. I'm not going to get any cold. I'm not going to get any wind. My thumb's not going to come poking out. And really, you won't even notice it when I'm wearing these gloves. That's how to darn a hole in your knit.